transitions uh, from youth transitions from learning to earning. Um, I'm sure in many regards uh, you just require the introduction which I, I shall give, but uh, you will know that he's worked for many years, probably more than he'd like me to, 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 to say, uh, in, as a researcher uh, in the fields of uh, educational training and skills, and it has written extensively and published on, on lifelong learning, apprenticeships, incentives to learn, employers' attitudes towards training and skills, and UK skills policy. He's currently director of the ESRC Centre based at Cardiff University uh, uh, on skills, knowledge and organisational performance. Uh, amongst other things, he's done a, a lot of consultancy and advisory, including to the parliamentary committees at uh, Westminster and Holyrood, uh, and is a member of the uh, Scottish Funding Council's skills committees. Um, he's Consultancy work includes working with the Treasury, the Cabinet Office, the Sector Skills Development <coughs> Agency, National Skills Task Force, and many others, including government organisations in Australia and New Zealand. Uh, I think you will agree, therefore, that we're very fortunate indeed to have you at, here today to present his, uh, his lecture <coughs> to us. Professor Yuki. <laughs> Well, can I begin by saying what an enormous pleasure it is to be here today. Um, yes, I've been working in this field for a, a long time, I'm 27 years full-time researcher, which is somewhat unusual in this day and age. Most people in the end uh, end up getting a proper teaching job uh, in university and um, they cease to be researchers. I've managed to escape that fate until now, though uh, things will change next year. What are you going to try and do in this lecture presentation is to try and flash out some of the ideas uh, which my centre has been probing around the way in which the labour market operates and the incentives that it provides to people in education, students and prospective students, to engage in learning or not to engage in learning and also in terms of what, which way those incentives will drive people in terms of their learning choice. I'm not going to have that much to say explicitly about information advice and guidance, but the underlying story that I'm going to tell is one that plainly has fairly major implications for information advice and guidance, and where it should sit within the priority order uh, of policy makers, and it's probably rather a different place from where it currently sits within the priority order of at least English policy makers. This seems to feel it's not not really one of the things that they ought to be worrying about uh, terribly much. The other thing with the lecture is transitions. Um, there's a great deal of literature that's come out in the last few years, basically since 2008, uh, the recession, around youth transitions into the labour market. And what I'm going to be arguing is that the current crisis has made this issue visible, but it hasn't actually created it. The problem was there quite a while before. So, with no more ado, because I want to finish this lecture uh, probably, definitely before 3 o'clock, um, we'll give you plenty of time to ask questions. Uh, let's get on. Okay. As I say, transitions into the labour market have become a big source of concern. They're now much longer, they're generally more complex, and they're certainly much more risky than they were 30 years ago. If you, you go back in time. Uh, transitions were seen as being a relatively unproblematic activity vast bulk of young people. There was only a, a small minority that you had to worry about. I suppose that belief really began to be eroded um, with the Great Recession of the early 1980s in the UK. But once that recession was over, when the 1990s, the noughties arrived, people seemed to be less worried about transition. But if you actually look at the time series data, what you see is that as um, Simon Schwartz and Ferguson say, today the journey from adolescence to adulthood is far more daunting it takes much longer, and the roadway is filled with far more potholes, one-way streets, and dead ends. The world has become more complex, the labour market has become more complex, the choices within education have become far more complex than they were 50 years ago, 
and choosing the right uh, pathway to take has become a lot more important. And I'm going to argue that one of the reasons it's become more important is because uh, of the way that the labour market changes have been tending to polarise opportunities and incentives. I guess a key thing to say that even if there had been no global recession, even if the bankers had behaved responsibly, uh, even if they'd actually understood what they were selling and we'd never had the crisis, youth transitions would still be problematic. Certainly in the anglo <coughs> saxon speaking world, there's no doubt about it that, that there's a much broader issue than just the um, recession. Structural shifts mean that the recession has made the effects of the structural shifts more obvious, but the effects still exist. And the other point to bear in mind is that if that is the case, then even when we come out of recession, whenever that may be, it means that the problem will not be solved. Yes, the youth unemployment levels may very well drop, but the overall issue of how transitions are managed will remain one which will be much more complex than it was in the past. What are these changes? Well, <coughs> I really want to mention these very briefly, uh, because you can read about them uh, elsewhere. Um, UK Commission for Employment and Skills, through its um, youth inquiry work, uh, CIPD, through some of its recent work on the young unemployed, has stressed the structural changes in the nature of the youth labour market. And those changes are, there's five of them, the ones I just there. The idea that employers are now increasingly looking for experience and that that's their key cri criteria when they're recruiting people. Uh, so young people get trapped in a no experience, therefore no job, no job, therefore no experience cycle. And the CIPD say breaking out of that is going to be really quite difficult unless and until employers change their preferences and start recognising that it's really quite a, a silly thing to expect young people to have substantial uh, mm. amounts of experience of working in a workplace just like theirs before they're willing to recruit people. Casualised forms of employment are another major problem. Young people find it very hard to live with small hours part-time contracts. They find zero hours extremely difficult. It's not to say that those are particularly great deals for, for adult workers, but young people find it particularly difficult. Informal recruitment methods. My sense has done quite a bit of work looking at what we know about recruitment and selection in, in, in the UK. And I think the key message would be this. That the HRM textbook model, and I went into your bookshop just to see what the, uh, the HRM textbooks were looking like, and I, I try not to look at them too often. Um, they haven't changed, the same old story. Uh, they have a lovely model of how recruitment uh, and selection should be undertaken. It's fine, but it's a minority sport. The bulk of the employers do not apply. That model of recruitment and selection is bulk of their workforce. They use the recruitment and selection methods which tend to exclude the young, not least the use of word of mouth. Word of mouth recruitment. A huge problem. Again, CIPD and UPCS have backed that up. Growth of small and medium sized enterprises, many of them very small, shifts in the proportion of people <coughs> employed in micro businesses has been quite spectacular. Uh, if you look at um, UKCS uh, publication, the Youth Employment Challenge, that explains and gives the figures <coughs> in detail. But those small businesses are precisely the ones who are likely to use informal recruitment. Methods. They won't be using the, uh, the textbook HRM model that was developed for IBM or Shell or BP or whoever in the 1980s. And overall, the size of the youth labor market has continued shrinking. Um, CIP reckon that 60% of the, the, the respondents to their survey, so it's a slightly biased survey, it's a survey of, of, of CIP members, but 60% said that their organisations had no recruitment channel for young people except at degree level. There was nothing below that. So the only young people that, that, that they actually had a formalised recruitment channel for was graduates. Other than that, they weren't bothering. So those sorts of changes are plainly going to cause us some big problems. Now, the traditional way in which people have fronted up to this, uh, particularly uh, researchers in uh, education departments, but also if you look at the kind of research that DFE and its predecessor uh, in the government department bodies have used. 
huge amounts of ideas that, that if we could improve pedagogy, if we could just change the curriculum, if we could develop new qualifications and courses, we could inculcate employability, however we choose to define it disturbingly. We could drive up education and training achievement, completions, levels of attainment, we have some special schemes for disadvantaged groups, and we have more and better industry education uh, collaboration, and I've been hearing that one for the last 30 years plus. <laughs> then we would somehow rather solve the problem of transitions. Now, I'm not going to say that I don't believe that, that, that there's a certain amount of truth in all of those things, I think there certainly is. But my presentation is going to ignore them from here on in. Uh, they're really interesting, but they're not what I'm concerned with, because there are plenty of other people who are busy researching and looking at all of this in enormous detail. I want to look at the, uh, the other side of the equation and try and explain why I think the other side of the equation matters and why it probably deserves more attention than it gets. Because in any process of transition, there's plainly preparation for the transition, and then there's the state into which people are transiting. transiting. And an awful lot of traditional research effort has looked at the preparation stage, and relatively little of it has looked at, at what people are aiming to get into, in other words, the world of work. Less of it. More balanced approaches needed. And I think that, uh, our, that the state and structure of the labour market, the employment opportunities therein, are really quite key to motivating young people to continue, participate, and achieve in education and training. <coughs> and they're also quite important to trying to make transitions smooth. <coughs> I'm not sure transitions are ever again going to be all that smooth. So in order to achieve better participation and achievement, which policymakers have had as a goal for um, you know, 16 to 19 positive for the last quarter of a century, Making transitions work better and maximising returns on public investment <coughs> in education and training, given that money is now very scarce, that third point really, really matters. It's vital to factor in the demand side of the equation. And much of what I'm going to say from here on in is about the levels of demand, structure of demand, quality as well as quantity of demand for labour. Geographic and sectoral distribution of employment opportunities and the incentives to learn that they create. Now, I've been quite interested in incentives to learn, and in a minute I'll come on to that. But just to reassure you that there is a structure to what I'm going to be saying, there is the structure. I'm going to talk a bit about jobs at the bottom end of the labour market, the problems they create, limited employer demand for skill, that's a reality, problems with low end vocational qualifications, see Professor Wolf. Complexity, risk, and disengagement, overqualification and underemployment, some suggested solutions, which I'm afraid is a rather short, uh, short <laughs> section, and then conclusions and final thoughts. Okay. Right, incentives to learn. Now, I've wasted quite a lot of the last two or three years trying to create what I believe to be an integrated framework for thinking about the incentives to learn. There's a huge body of literature, which I spent, I reckon, six months just reading through on the different ways in which different academic disciplines, primarily educationists and economists, have thought about the incentives to learn. And they all do it from their own very narrow particular take on the issue. <coughs> what I've tried to do, uh, I'm not sure it's successful, but worth a go, is to try and create a more unified framework for evaluating the strength, pattern, um, duration of different incentives and try and map them. Uh, what I'm arguing is that you can really break it down into two simple types. Type 1 incentives are those inside the learning process. Come on in a minute, I'll tell you what they are. And they're the ones that educate people in education departments tend to be very, very keen on. Type 2 incentives are generated in wider society and when they're generated in the labour market, economists are interested in them. If they're generated within the wider culture, parental culture, ethnic culture, uh, community culture, whatever it may be, sociologists are quite interested in that. And I suppose the argument that I'm going to make is that if type 2 incentives are weak and complex or uncertain, learners may not participate and succeed, and that endlessly trying to adjust type 1 incentives on its own may not work if the type 2 incentives are not strong enough. 
Okay, so examples of type one, so that we're very clear what, what, what I think they are. They're the usual things that you know, anyone in the Department of Education will, will know about. Curriculum, pedagogy, assessment, assessment encourages participation rather than rationing. Institutional cultures and schools and colleges that nurture potential, celebrate achievement, <coughs> and so on. Now, we all know that all of that is very important. That's what tends to be very visible. But type two incentives are often much longer lasting because they last throughout the rest of your life once you leave the education system, uh, and, or they last insofar as they're present. Policymakers have been very keen on the first bullet point. They love to look <coughs> at wage returns to particular qualifications. Uh, unfortunately, you tend to look at average returns, which are deeply misleading. There's a lot of variation around the average. Other benefits um, which come to, to push people to learn, the intrinsic interest in the job, the opportunities for progression, travel. Social status but from higher level occupations, which pushes a lot of people to learn. License to practice and mandatory CPD regulations, which plainly mean makes lifelong learning an obligation, not just an option. So for those jobs that have it, they produce very strong type two incentives that last through your working life. Cultural expectations in society are technical class segments therein. The non-economic benefits to doing enhanced satisfaction. And the last bullet point, in a sense, is the lifelong learning bullet point, um, which policymakers in the UK have basically consigned to the conceptual dustbin. All very nice, all very lovely, but they're not really very interested in that anymore. They're, they're really only interested in the economic gains. Uh, they've decided that ultimately they are narrow utilitarians when it comes to what it's about. Probably a very unfortunate choice on their part, but that's another lecture. Okay, so having set, set out my stall in terms of what I think the incentive structure is broadly defined, What's the problem with what, what, what I and some colleagues in my centre, and actually from some, some other colleagues in sociology and a, uh, personnel management, define as bad jobs? Well, bad jobs can be defined as the slide suggests. Low pay, less than two thirds of the median wage, uh, about 20% of the working population <coughs> at the moment in the UK are earning, 20, uh, are earning less than two thirds of the median wage. Insecure and casualised work, lack of control over your own job in terms of how you pace the work, in terms of how you do the job, high levels of stress, which is often associated with ongoing work intensification. Um, I'm sure academics will <laughs> yeah, a little nervous shiver there as they think, yeah, that's me. Uh, fortunately, you do tend to, we, we tend to avoid the dull, boring, repetitive, short job cycle time element of a lot of bad jobs. Um, job cycle time is 30 seconds. Day in, day out, until you go mad. Lack of opportunities for progression. I'll, I'll come back to six because that actually really matters. A lot of people get trapped in these jobs. Now you might say, well, okay, it's bad news if you're in one, but what's this got to do with incentives? Well, it's got to do with incentives for variety of reasons, but the lack of progression one is quite important. We know from research that my centre been here that job opportunities to progress are often not very good in a lot of these low-end jobs. We've been looking curiously at the cafe sector. Mm -hmm. Very under-researched sector, it's actually a growing area of employment. What we found is that yes, some, some workers will move up to be supervisors, they will, work, you know, will move up to be manager in a Starbucks or a Costa or whatever. But they are small steps for low rewards. Very often the manager earns 50p an hour more than the workers they're managing. And actually they spend up to 90% of their time doing exactly the same job as the people they're managing, like making and serving coffee. They just do the management um, in the sort of washing up time. And the really interesting issue, which we know not just from our own research, but from huge <coughs> quantitative studies like Chung and Mackay's work or DWP in 2011, that qualifications play very little role in the vast bulk of progression by low-end workers. Whatever it helps them to progress, it ain't the fact that they acquired a qualification. So that's a, it's a bit worrying, very quite worrying. The other important point is that low-end jobs are not fading away. In the early noughties, the story was that it was going to be a knowledge-based economy. Low-end jobs were just going to gradually dwindle away as we all became more skilled and everything would be very, very sunny. 
Well, it didn't pan out that way, and, and I have to say that some of us uh, who are fairly cynical in, in nature, like myself, uh, never really thought that it was going to pan out that way. But we know very clearly that the number of low paid jobs in the UK as a portion of the overall workforce will not start to drop this side of 2020. They're probably actually increasing at the moment. And interestingly, there's a very interesting paper by the New Economics Foundation which shows that the range of jobs available for non-graduates is shrinking, surprise, surprise. And that most of the job growth for non-graduates is likely to be in the lowest paying sectors of the economy. Upskilling these workers will not have much effect. Mm -hmm. It's not going to solve their problems in terms of the kind of jobs that they're likely to access. Let's take one example for a, for a, for a real sector. Um, let's, let's, let's call it math. Let's go for mass retailing because retailing is such a big part of our economy. The largest single occupational group in the UK is the retail assistants. And that's actually not counting checkout operators. They're a separate occupational subcategory. If you put them in, then shop assistants, you know, should generically say that shop assistants, then it becomes even bigger. There are more people employed in retailing than there are in manufacturing. It's also, or certainly was when it was doing well, the dominant model for many other bits of the service sector. So you would find managers running fitness centres who would say, oh yeah, we, we really want to be like Tesco's. Uh, banks used to say this, we really want to be like Tesco's. Which I always find really frightening, because I, I really don't like Tesco's that much as a shop. But the idea of it being a model for how anyone would run their bank seems to me to be awful. Uh, but fitness centres are saying, no, no, it's all about customer care. We, we don't want our fitness instructors to have you know, huge, huge levels of skill, unlike, say, a French, for the management of a French fitness centre. No, no, we just want them to be good at custom, this generic thing, the customer service. And, and everyone said, we want to be like the, the big, successful retailers. The final bullet point's really scary. It may not be true now. Um, it, but it was true when I wrote the bullet point, it may not be true to, for much longer. But Morrison's was possibly still is, the largest provider of something labelled apprenticeships. They wouldn't be recognised as apprenticeships elsewhere in Europe, but no matter. Fast, uh, fast bulky level two, a possible service for existing employees. But that tells you something about the importance of, if you actually look at the number of service sector, of, of retail sector, uh, so-called apprenticeships, it's a huge part of the apprenticeship success. <coughs> Well, it's a sexual labour market. And when I say dysfunctional, it's plainly not dysfunctional from the employer's point of view, but it may be dysfunctional from the point of view of individuals and wider society. Internal labour markets in most big retailers are pretty limited. There are few upward runs, and the vast bulk of people are not going to access, access them. Some will, but that's not that many. Moreover, those who are trying to climb in are now increasingly meeting graduates cascading down the structure. 29% of all recent graduates work in the management to so in retail. So the jobs that you could have aspired to 20 years ago if you started on the shop floor are going to be a damn sight hard to get hold of because there's, like, there's a graduate who's now going to be parachuted in to be head of a particular section. Much of this low-end retail work is relatively de skilled, and the specifications for the vocational qualifications reflect this reality. It's interesting that the Morrison's um, trainees, uh, apprentices, are not studying a retailing NPQ. They're studying a customer service NPQ. Go and have a look. I downloaded the um, City and Guilds level two um, NPQ in customer service. Runs to, the specification runs to just over 220 pages. I don't think there's a single skill in that qualification, described in that qualification, that you wouldn't expect a reasonably competent person to have acquired simply by doing the job for nine months. Um, it's a really problematic model of an occupational um, skill profile, and, of and the qualifications then reflect that, that problematic. And we also know that skill utilisation is often extremely poor. There are a lot of retail workers who are wildly overqualified jobs they're doing, particularly married women returners who've landed up sitting on, on Waitrose checkout. Um, they've probably got A-levels, lots of them have got degrees. Um, possibly not the best use of their skills. A couple of lovely little quotes um, from um, Johnson's study of um, 
young retail, male retail workers um, receiving training. Uh, we're not, it's not absolutely clear whether the training they're receiving is training to gain or apprenticeship, but it frankly makes pretty little difference. These are people who've been doing the job for a while and now being trained largely at your and my expense as taxpayers, and that's their clothes. This one will come in once a week and review us serving a customer or something, and then, well, hey, we've got a certificate. Employers are not sitting there saying, I hope someone with NBQ in retailing comes along because we could really do with someone like that. There wasn't actually giving us any training, it was a total waste of time. It's like if the government really wants everyone to have a qualification by their name, yeah, sure it'll work, but it's not going to achieve anything. It's interesting that the, the, the kids going through this process have probably got a more realistic view of its value <laughs> than many of the policy makers who designed these policies. And I don't want to tell you something. Those, those two respondents are not stupid. They were actually sussed out what's happening and thinking, well, very well, but sorry, what's the added value here? And, and this of course is the punchline, for those who think, well, no, they're heading towards such jobs, they create weak incentives to <coughs> No amount of fiddling around with pedagog pedagogy curriculum or assessment in and of itself will compensate for the weak, patchy, uncertain type 2 incentives coming from that particular labour market. Many people do not like to hear that message. They believe that there is some magic combination of <coughs> curriculum, pedagogy and assessment that can somehow override labour market incentives. And I am afraid that I think that after 30 years of experimentation and trying we need to accept that's probably not the case. It's not to say that you can't make type 1 incentives stronger and that that's not important. But on its own, it probably isn't enough. Because if in any given labour market the number of jobs is finite at any given moment and is exceeded by the supply of those seeking work, and the number of good and desirable jobs is a finite subset of the jobs available, then the following conclusions are likely to be correct. There will be losers. Some people will get jobs, but they won't get the good jobs. And some people will get no jobs at all. There's a job queue. And education and training can move in between <coughs> up and down that job queue. But in and of itself, it doesn't create more or better jobs. It just repositions who gets those jobs. Raising educational attainment will not give everyone a good job on its own. If everyone tomorrow was magically given a not just a degree and a little piece of paper, but the actual learning that went with it, that still wouldn't mean that there wouldn't be 20% of the jobs in the, in the UK that are market or low pay. And many of those jobs would carry on being low pay, and it would just mean that they'd be done by graduates. I'll come back to it. They, would, they, they might have to be done by graduates, because I've got a scary statistic for you on that one. <laughs> So, the higher the level of unemployment, the higher the levels of inequality in terms of job quality across the available outcomes, the larger the pool of bad or poor jobs relative to good ones, particularly within specific local labour markets, and the weaker the returns to qualifications, the more likely it is that at least some people thinking about investing in learning or think to themselves, well, I'm faced with the prospect of getting a lousy job, and the incentives I have to learn are pretty complex, they're pretty patchy, they're pretty uncertain, and they're therefore risky. And I'm going to come back to the issue of risk. But in the face of that, those four points, which look to me pretty much like the English labour market at the moment, particularly in certain areas of the country, young people, and actually adults as well, will tend to respond rationally. And the local labour market point is important because we also know that there's clustering and reinforcement effects going on in labour markets. Um, Anne Green, David Owen's work on um, local labour markets 2006 showed that bad jobs are becoming more concentrated within, within specific la la local labour markets. That you're getting good jobs clustering together in certain geographical localities. You're getting a narrowing and attenuation of job opportunities in other local labour markets. We also know that many of the opportunities that young people tend to access are in 
areas of the economy where low quality employment across the range of dimensions I've already suggested are quite large. A lot of young people go to hospitality and retail. And we know that both those sectors have structural features of their employment market which are probably not providing terribly high quality employment uh, a lot of the time. And in positional competition for a finance supply of good jobs, quite a lot of people know that certain types of student will tend to get certain types of work, given, on their, given their social class background and the kinds of institutions they've been to. So for those students who are not those kind of students, uh, what are the impact on their incentives to learn? Because in a sense, it's not a level playing field. And an awful lot of young people know that one way or the other. People do perceive it every morning. And aspiration may reflect the material reality of how good and bad jobs are currently allocated. And the Gracie and Kelly quote, and the Gracie and Kelly article is a really useful article, um, which I um, referenced in my, my, my scope paper on transitions. I think it's quite an important one. We always assume that when young people do something, or well, policymakers do to assume that when young people do something that policymakers don't like, young people are acting irrationally. They're just being silly, or, or just you know, irresponsible, or they're not following the thing. No, actually, I think the opposite is true. I think within, they're certainly acting rationally within a bounded, bounded way. Uh, quite often, they're acting rationally in a, in a, in a, in a more total vision of, real, uh, of rationality. They are actually act reacting quite <coughs> sensibly to the structure of incentives that they face. So if you want to change their behavior, change the structure, which is difficult. Again, Ingrid, Ingrid Schoon's point makes the same point in a different way. Um, there's also some very interesting research by um, uh, a couple of researchers, Saint Sinclair and someone else, looking at young people's aspirations that show very clearly that at, at, at key, I think it's key stage three, young people's aspirations are far higher than the job opportunities that are available in our labor market. And grad, that fairly rapidly, they're, 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 they become more realistic. Uh, their aspirations are then recalibrated downwards to actually match what the labor market has to offer. And I think Archer's point is by that if we want to change our, our ambition, we need to stop the idea that we're changing <coughs> individual minds we need to worry about collective circumstances and we need to worry therefore about what the European Union talks about more and better jobs. But of course that's a big ask for policymakers. Even when the economy is doing well, it's a big ask. Okay, on to employer demand, because in a sense that's the next ghastly um, truth. Employer demand for skills uh, is really probably a bit weaker than we think. The quote from Francis Green uh, was a UK CES uh, Praxis paper <coughs> on job quality is a really important one. If you want to explain why we don't do very well in the OECD lead program on post compulsory participation, don't look at schooling, don't look at qualifications, don't look at pedagogy, just look at that quote. That the labour market is actually not providing the demand pull that would actually make young people sit there and think, yeah, I really need to get those qualifications, I really need to do a bit of post-compulsory schooling, because if I don't, the labour market will penalise. We actually send weaker messages, and that's a huge, huge problem. The other fact on that slide, which, which I regard as, it was one of the few facts in recent years that has genuinely astonished I'm hard to establish after 27 years of full-time research. According to Jeff Mason and colleagues at the Lake Centre, I've no reason to doubt Jeff, it's labour force survey data, and it's been replicated by other survey uh, analysis. Workforce training across the UK, workforce in terms of what proportion of the workforce got some training, peaked in the year 2000 and has been in decline ever since. We are back to where we were in 1993. And that, despite all of the subsidy, all of the exaltation, all of the fighting, it actually has had not only no positive effect, but less than any effect. We've actually been sliding there and backwards. And <coughs> notice the slide started long before the recession. That's a devastating fact that suggests that our training policies, 
for the last 20 years have had pretty close to no real impact on how employers are choosing to invest in their workforce. This also is a, 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 a startling thing. I actually went and read the government consultation on um, the apprenticeship standards in England. Uh, it's probably not a document many people have ever waited for. It's pretty, pretty dull. But hidden amidst the dullness, as is so often the case, are some startling facts. There are 357 responses, not all of them I hasten to add from employers, quite a lot of them private training providers. And that was what came out of it. 70% of respondents rejected the idea that maths and English should be required in all frameworks for apprenticeship. Don't even. We can manage without maths and English. 68% didn't want ICT qualification in all frameworks. We don't need that kind of stuff. 53, only 53% agreed that all six of the personal learning and thinking skills were needed in all programs. In other words, 47% thought they, they weren't needed. How much thinner can you make your framework was plainly the question that was running through the minds of the respondents. And only 35% thought that a ludicrous and generous 250 hours off the job learning was needed. Uh, they wanted far less, and they actually got it. The government scaled the off the job and it went down to 100 hours in response to uh, lack of enthusiasm. Now, if you show those figures to people from most North European countries, they just go into shock. Because the idea that this, that, that kind of attitude will underpin a working apprenticeship <coughs> system is completely astonishing to them. They just cannot believe it. The idea that you wouldn't want your young trainees in an apprenticeship to learn maths in their native language is astonishing. They wouldn't need to do some ICT learning. They wouldn't need some personal learning and thinking skills. Most overseas, most, most European apprenticeships, they'd also be doing a hard science subject. Uh, it's probably physics. Uh, they'd certainly be doing, many of them would be doing foreign language. They'd probably be doing some history and some other general educational learning. What we have said is, that is how small can we make the optical element? How small can we make the educational element in this program? Um, how can we maximise the use of the government subsidy the government's giving us while minimising the return on that public investment? Not a good message does suggest some structural problems with, with demand for skills. That's also a gem-like quote. I love that one. Too much aspiration is actually a bad thing. I suspect some of the people in this room are guilty of encouraging too much aspiration. There is a mismatch between employer requirements and learner aspirations. We still have a large number of jobs which are at level two or below. The drive for more and more advanced apprenticeships is creating the expectation amongst young people and parents who then become unwilling to consider the lower levels. And why, you see? And actually, to be fair to the luckless Shropshire training provider, they were only telling the truth. Uh, in a sense, don't shoot the messenger. They're not the problem. Well, they're not the, the direct cause of the problem. The direct cause of the problem is that employers have lots of jobs at level two. <coughs> this all feeds back into the strength of incentives that the labour market provides to young people. It feeds back into the design of variable EQs. Where a lot of employer input, particularly from the less ambitious employers in the sector, puts a break on, on the breadth, depth, and transferability that's specified. The potential for skills supply to exceed demand and create overqualification and underutilization. Okay, so following on from that last slide, a few other points. Problems with low level VQs. The Wolf Review told policymakers something that I think a fair number of us have known for quite a while, which is that there are a lot of low-level VQs, which while they further a progression, they while they further a participation agenda, may not actually do very much more than that. They give people something to do. It's not entirely clear that it leads anywhere that's particularly useful. They're just doing something. Uh, and the participation argument uh, is something that people like Larry Steedman have recently criticised. I think rightly, uh, as problematic policy goal. Participation in what matters. Competence-based qualifications are often pretty narrow, they're very task-specific, little or no general education, offer no foundation for citizenship, lifelong learning, or return to academic learning, 
and have a very <coughs> often have a limited hold on recruitment selection. And they are very different. As anyone who's read the Brockman, Clark, and Winch book on vocational qualifications in Europe will know, they are very different from what most of our European competitors offer young people. They get a much broader diet of general education within the vocational stream. Wolf concluded quite correctly that many VQs, which might, may or may not be suitable for adults, and I think there's an interesting argument to be had on that one, uh, whether they are or not suitable for adults, they're extremely unsuitable for, for young people, particularly when the course has become a VQ. But the course of study is basically, you do this VQ, you pass it, I collect my money, and you, you, you move on. That's a really problematic model, but it's the one that funding council and many others pursue uh, for a very long time. However, Wolf sets everyone a big challenge, which at the moment policymakers seem to be very keen to duck, uh, which is around unqualification design. Um, how can we redesign qualifications? Well, in order to show better wage returns uh, and hold on the labour market. Really interesting question. In areas like cleaning, retailing, hospitality, what level <coughs> 2 VQ could you design that would actually show a substantial wage return? Unknown, but possibly not very, very easy to do. Another point is that for the lower level VQs, they're very, very, they set up a very complex incentive structure, dependent, as we know from research, on age, gender, type and level of qualification, subject and occupation it's related to, location in which the learning takes place. Though interestingly, recent research findings have suggested that, that, that the workplace premium has vanished for VQs. We don't know why. And who pays for it? If the employer pays for it, very often it actually appears to have more value. Partly because the employer wouldn't pay for it unless they thought they could use it and then reward people for having it. But that's a complex pattern of incentives. So low-level VQs, they're a bit risky. The returns to them are variable, complex, and sometimes poor. The returns to low level to level two A VQs in particular are very low and very uncertain. And all the talk that uh, is in policy documents about averages is completely misleading. There is a huge variation around the average. The average tells you very, very little. So complexity and uncertainty equals risk. Those at the lower end of the ability range or labour market often face the weakest and most uncertain type two labour market incentives. They're also studying for the qualifications that show the weakest and most uncertain returns. And for those who can't aspire to enter higher education, the choices may be poor and non-participation. At least semi-rational, probably actually fully rational in some cases. I've already made this point, but it's worth repeating. Participation on its own is a very strange policy goal. Most European countries do not regard participation in and of itself as a sufficient policy goal for, you, for what they want young people to be doing. The whole idea is the Henry Stephen has written a really interesting little article in the centerpiece. Uh, it's basically saying um, the cow category neat is a really problematic one, in part because the idea that as long as you're participating in something, even if what you're participating in is valueless, you're not neat. So the idea that neat is somehow, you know, if you're neat, it's dark and black, and if you're not neat, it's much lighter and better, possibly not. We also know that many people uh, give, give up, uh, well, many people don't participate because they think they've got a strong chance of not achieving. Many people drop out because a job is offered. They may be acting rationally, given what they know about how the local labour market um, actually functions. We also know from a lot of research that's been done on private pension provision that those who have few resources tend to be very, very risk averse because they can't afford to lose the scarce few resources they have. Those who have lots of resources can afford to take risks. So um, children from better off backgrounds can succeed because they can fail. They can actually do things that kids from poorer backgrounds don't dare to try because it's risky and if they fail the consequences of failure are more significant to them than their parents. Now we come to the problem of oversupply. Oversupply is currently thought of very much in terms of what policy makers are volume. Too many young people chasing too few jobs. 
underemployment. Actually, a much bigger long-term problem may be underemployment and overqualified workforce chasing jobs that often demand limited skill. Why does that matter? Well, because labour market power equals relative scarcity. That's you know, basic labour market economics 101 that policymakers endlessly miss. And one of the things that I really enjoyed in Alison Moore's review was that quote. Other things being equal, high wage returns to a particular form of qualification mean high demand for or short supply of the skills and qualities to which it attests. That's a real stark problem. Because we know that for many of the qualifications we're offering, <coughs> that is not likely to be the case. But scarcity equals power, bargaining power, wage power. So if there isn't relative scarcity, don't expect high returns. And unfortunately, we've created a situation where not only is there not scarcity, there's actually probably superfluity of skills. That's really um, the skills survey of individuals. People who've got qualifications they believe are higher than needed to get the job and to do the job they're currently in. But that's the trend there. Uh, skill survey, uh, now called the workplace skill survey, has been out in the field this year. Uh, the results are expected next April. Uh, I think if I were joining the dotted line, we'll be, how much will be over the 39%? How much will be over the 40%? 45%? Who knows? But uh, let's put it this way, I'm not expecting the trend to reverse. Anderson, the UKCS Youth Inquiry showed 23% of 24 to 29 year olds are in, or have got degrees, are in, sorry, 26% are in, are, are, in, are in occupations that require it. We've also got mismatched intermediate level, which is smaller but still by OECD standards large. We have major problems about underemployment. We also have major problems that many, or at least a proportion of these people get stuck. This isn't some transitory phenomenon that they move out of. Quite a lot of them seem to be getting stuck for longer and longer periods of time in jobs where they're overqualified. Really scary statistic. This, this really knocked me back when I saw it. <laughs> UKCS and Joseph Browntree had a little exploration of what would happen if we, if we had or were going to hit the leech targets. If we hit the leech targets in 2020, how much would that reduce poverty? Well, the answer was not a lot. <coughs> the estimates varied, but it was, it was pretty significant, um, insignificant, um, uh, statistically insignificant um, uh, uh, amount. But well, what they did found, using the Institute of Employment Studies, no, Institute of Employment Research, sorry, um, uh, working futures <coughs> model, that if nothing changes on current, the way the current um, education training system is supplying more skilled labour, by 2020, across the lowest three deciles of earning, in other words, by the lowest thir earning 30% of our workforce, at least 30% of those workers well, high EQF levels fall to eight. In other words, they'll have some degree or above qualifications. And in fact, for the lowest decile, which will be people who are in work poverty, almost without a doubt, 33% of them will have some degree or above qualification. Now, that is not good news. And were I running this student loan company, I'd be thinking about what my next job might be. <laughs> <laughs> over qualification reduces trade down. We all know about uh, graduates and graduates displacing other sorts of workers there. But we've had a very problematic policy combination. More, the goal of more AG, weak inflation by some guidance, I think it's fair to say, increasing positional competition for limited supply of good or minimally good jobs. The UKCS's estimate, uh, the OECD's estimate, the growth in highly qualified man person power is outstripping the increase in the supply of jobs that need it by, by a factor of six times. And then on top of that, you can put in a fifth point, which is the recession. Big problem. Outcome? That's the outcome. Training down to ensure getting a job, widening dispersion in graduate earnings, training down displaces other young people. Scarring impact on lifetime earnings may be significant for people for graduates who get trapped on their time in these jobs. 
assigning student applications that prospective students are getting the message pretty quickly and are starting to look harder at the value of that degree. A chilling effect on aspirations for those not aiming for aging. Increasing uncertainty about the outcomes of investing time, energy, money in all forms of post compulsory education training. Don't want to have, with an audience like you, I don't have to go through this. You already know all about this. But I think it was very helpful at us and we'll put it out. Because again, it's not the model of how people make choices in the minds of policymakers, politicians, and civil servants. They don't see it like that. Because their careers have not looked like that. They've actually been simple and linear. Private school, Oxford, a uh, couple of years in the think tank, career politician. <laughs> <laughs> Seriously, I mean, you know, look, look, look at their CVs. Okay, the implications. Well, what are the implications for this? Well, one is that broader rather than narrower courses, particularly for vocational learners, might make some sense. But of course, it's not the direction we've been heading in for the last 30 years. Good in your be pleased to see point two. Good information advice and guidance is helpful, but good information advice and guidance requires a clear understanding of the complex patterns of risk and reward. It's not just about job things out there, it's what they lead to, what they pay. And actually getting your head around that, I think it's really quite difficult. And although the data's there, it's not presented in a terribly user-friendly format because basically policymakers are not necessarily all that keen that too many other people know about some of these findings because if they did, the current basis for relative policy would start to implode. Participation in and of itself in post-compulsory education is a pretty feeble goal. Participation in what is the question you need to ask? In what leading to what? Because if the answer is participation in something that's pretty crappy, that doesn't lead anywhere, then <coughs> given how scarce people resources are, there is a serious question whether that kind of participation makes a lot of sense. Could we really do better? I ask myself. OK, we're now on to the solutions. Uh, well, one solution that obviously government, uh, and, and uh, by government, I mean any party in government, at <coughs> any given time over the last 20 years, has got incredibly wildly, and I'm afraid I would have to say over-enthusiastically enthusiastic about his being apprenticeship. We need to be clear where we stand. And there's an interesting contrast here between Scotland. Scotland has been much more successful at making apprenticeship work in the way it's meant to do. Not perfect, but a lot better. Far more of their apprenticeship places are for young people, not existing adult employees. They have a higher proportion of employers engaged in apprenticeship, and far more of their apprenticeships are at level three and uh, level two. Now, the Scottish labour market and economy is not that different from English. So if they can do it, they set their minds to it, why can we not? Because at the moment, a lot of what we label apprenticeship in England would be laughed at by European employers. They were just looking at it and saying, well, oh, sorry, this isn't apprenticeship, this is adult in training. Uh, this is accreditation of prior learning for adult workers. Or it's, if it is for young people, it's at such a low level and with such a narrow diet of vocational learning that we would not count this as an apprenticeship. Now, I'm afraid that that's the simple fact. The other crucial fact is that trainee demand exceeds employer supply. There are far more young people who wish to be apprentices than there are apprenticeship places, particularly in good firms. The, pro the proportion of young people applying to become BT apprentices, which is now open also to adult workers who genuinely want to be trained to work for BT, uh, I think they have something like 100 applicants for every place. It's much harder to get a BT apprenticeship than it is to get a place in Oxford. So if you want to make apprenticeship work, the crucial issue is not young people's aspirations, <coughs> it's employer commitment. And unfortunately, we, it seems to me that one of the problems that apprenticeship faces is it is, it is great great grandson or great great granddaughter of YTS. But actually, if you go back to two year YTS, two year YTS are 
to your work experience, had a much more demanding off the job element, 13 whole weeks off the job, not 100 hours that we reset to the specification, which would suggest that we've had usual mid practice in the last 25 years. The other solution that I flag up very briefly, <coughs> I don't really have time to go into it in any great detail here, but I think it, the, in the background paper which I've provided with these PowerPoints, the reference is there is to a report by Hamilton for the OECD, the hypertext link is in the, in the paper. Really interesting that in the United States of America at state level, the idea of vocational, broad vocational pathways, fewer in number, six in some states, you know, up to 13 in others, but that takes out a whole spectrum of employment opportunities encompasses both vocational and the educational pathway into those occupations, also linked quite often to economic development and cluster policy, seems to be a notion which is being picked up. It's being picked up in Australia to some extent, it's being picked up in New Zealand quite strongly, the OECD is now beginning to, 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 to get on this bandwagon. It's really interesting that in terms of pathways, the pathways are not just pathways through education to a point of transition into the education, into the work, the, the employment system. They are then pathways that carry on inside the labour market in terms of being able to move up the occupational ladder. That really seems to be one of the key things. That instead of training, seeing young people as training, as being trained for an entry level job, which then, you know, after that, you're on your own is actually about seeing it as a ladder that extends you know, up through the education and training system and then up through the labour market, the employment system, the occupation and the sector. I think it's an interesting model. But again, the kind of BQs that we currently have are precisely the kind of BQs we don't need to make this kind of model. I suppose the other area where we really, really, really do need to think hard in terms of finding solutions is by issuing a challenge to employers. And I take my hat off to the UK Commission for Employment Skills for throwing down the gauntlet to its own members through its youth inquiry. I think that by basically saying that whatever problems we have with young people and their ability to integrate into the labour market, the bulk of the responsibility for tackling those problems now must come to light with employers through things like offering good, high-quality work placements and work experience schemes is a really important one. Whether that challenge will be taken up by government, whether it will be replayed to employers by government, and whether the last bulk of employers will do anything other than harm sit on their hands and stare at the ceiling while the challenge is being issued. <coughs> that is another matter entirely. Uh, my suspicion is that we do have a huge problem in that we spent the last 30 years telling employers that they are customers of the education and training system rather than participants within it. And therefore they tend to be rather grumpy customers who answer to every problem is to say, well if only you lousy school teachers, if only you lazy colleges, if only you lazy universities which provide a better caliber of student more employable at the end of it, we would be able to do even less training than we're currently doing. Problematic model. I really do think that there are obviously employers who don't fit that model, but there are enough who do for it to be a major part of the difficulties we face. Okay, my final thoughts. <coughs> I think it is really worth it. Well, I would say this since I've invented this model, uh, type 1 and type 2 incentives. Because I suspect that when you actually look hard at the type two incentives that a lot of young people face, they're pretty feeble. They're pretty risky, they're pretty uncertain, and young people are going to interpret them in ways that tend <coughs> to lead towards choices which may be rational but, but problematic. We really need to try and reduce over time the number of poor quality jobs. Because they, particularly where they're the jobs that young people are likely to believe themselves to be heading for, they make things more difficult, they make learning less likely to be incentivised, and they make the transitions much more conditional and uncertain. The design of qualifications and courses for initial, vocational, actually I'd say training, 
but you could say education since the diplomas have now gone or going. We know what, what we used to think we knew what, before Mr. Gove arrived, what the academic route was there for, we used to think that it was doing okay. Apparently all the cards are in the air now, but, but I'll, leave it, I'll leave people on the royal route. Yeah, yeah. For people not on the A-level route, in post-compulsory education, we really need to go back to basics and look at both the courses and the qualifications and say, are these fit for purpose when we look at what other countries are doing? Solutions weren't easy to find, but unless we start to tackle some of these problems, then those problems will remain with us for a very long time to come. There are things that can be done by education and training providers to improve the employability and work readiness of young people, but they often require a positive input from employers. I would argue that if I was Secretary of State or whatever, which isn't going to ever happen, thank goodness, <laughs> bringing together apprenticeships, work experience, qualification design, recruitment selection and employment practices, rethinking occupational wage and career structures and their skill requirements, and labor market regulation would probably be needed to, to actually tackle the type two incentives problems. Now, you couldn't do it overnight. You'd have to do it in baby steps, given where we're starting from. But that would be my general suggestion. Final slide. If we want to minimize unemployment, underemployment, credentials, bumpy transitions, and wasted both public and private investment. We also require, and this is the message which my centre has been um, producing for the last 14 years of its life, we need product market, innovation, and competitive strategies within more businesses that drive rising demand for skills. Until demand for skills rises substantially within our labour market and economy, the problems I've described cannot be solved. Consequent upon the first point of point is the second. Systems of work organisation, job design and employee relations that stress good skills utilisation, workplace skill formation and workplace innovation are also critical. Those are both the big parts. Now I suppose that the overall message, that one of the messages that might come from what I've said, is that the world of the labour market is really quite complex. It doesn't mesh well with the policy record. And I'm one of the sort of, in a sense, ticking time bombs or ticking parcels that I could, you could argue I'm handing to you as the information advice and guidance community is that you have a role in transmitting some quite problematic news to a lot of people. Thank you very much. <laughs>
And then there's the issue about the links to social mobility, um, because you're saying it's incredibly self-reinforcing. If you want to do something about that, there is an argument for IAG there. But then it's got to confront some of those realities. So, I mean, it seems to me that's the second area we might want to kind of explore. But I don't know if you want to. I, I might like to say a little bit more about the IG thing before we open it up, because you you, you said how important it is. But it seemed to me you were saying how important it is for individuals. See, the leech argument was it matters in terms of policy because we need a skills revolution, okay. and that requires investment from uh, from employers the state and individuals have got to make this happen and therefore we should invest in career service, which is now become a national career service, and the rationale is precisely that, to encourage individuals to raise their skills. Now that was the argument and my assumption is you don't buy it. Uh, no, do you? I, I hope you do. I do, but, but I think that I would think of it in terms of labour market inflation, uh, in a sense. And although, I mean obviously the two are, are, are bound up, I always think of it, I suppose, Perhaps wrongly, information advice and guidance is largely being focused on individuals or perhaps on groups of students uh, or learners or potential learners. Labour market information is plainly plain vital to that role, but it's also vital to employers to get them to try and do their workforce planning in order to forecast their future skill requirements and to try and get them to up their game and spot the gaps. So, LMI is absolutely crucial. What's really interesting is that there's now a senior civil servant in um, Biz, who used to be in DWP, who, when I made exactly that point, said, no, no, we don't need LMI. We just need, we just need good careers advice uh, about the kind of jobs that people could do, and then they will sort it out for themselves. And we certainly don't want to waste money collecting lots of LMI. Now, fortunately, he has been overruled for the moment. But, it's a very strange sort of textbook model that all you have is the individual. You give them some information and then they will go away and make their decision. And in a sense, the way that many policymakers confront information by some guidance is a purely uh, labour market economics textbook model. Very, very dangerous because it bears no relationship to how people make decisions or indeed how the labour market works. But, but there we go. So no, I, I don't have any difficulty. I would spend more money on I information advice and guidance and actually cut back some spending on certain sorts of training throughput. Well, perhaps you should become Secretary of State after all. No. <laughs> okay. Um, okay, questions or comments? Or questions or comments. And could you indicate who you are and where you're from, please? You're all horrified, aren't you? Um, Heather Jackson, I'm Chair of Navy, which is the adult. Actually, could you stand up, Heather? Would you mind? I think people stand up so everyone can see. Uh, I've got lots right. of things I could say, but one in particular one is about the MVQ level two. Um, I heard what you say, said, but I, I think it has to be said that for those young people in particular, or adults who are very low skilled, there must be some intrinsic value in undergoing some kind of program that will improve their skills in some way, regardless of the labour market situation. There must be, you're implying an intrinsic value isn't enough. And I think there must be some intrinsic value in that kind of learning. Mm. I think there probably is an intrinsic value, but, but don't forget that, you know, in a sense, I suppose what I'm criticising is the use of it as a huge blanket programme like Train to Gain. It, it's interesting that the Train to Gain evaluations are very clear. The, the real bonus from Train to Gain was that it improved a lot of people's learning confidence. But that's I, a big deal. It is a big, a big deal. deal. But I think I could have done it more cheaply in oh, different ways. Nice. Yeah. In different yeah. ways. Um, but what's really clear is that the long term, what, 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 what big econ econometric data we have from tax returns suggests that the wage premium that people believe that people are getting from trying to gain doesn't exist. And that's a real problem. And I think, yes, there are plenty for people who, who are right at the bottom of the learning pile. We need to move them forward in easy steps. There's no two ways about that. We need to build their confidence. But having VQs, which are the main learning entitlement and performance indicator for our education and training system, which are specified at levels far, far lower and far, far more narrowly than in most other European countries, does not seem to me to be a terribly helpful way to go. It's not to say that offering disadvantaged young people <coughs> and adults learning opportunities and finding ways of progressing them so that they can move forward in, in relatively easy steps. Highly important. 
But the way that we've done it through our use of VQs and specification of VQs, I think is <coughs> problematic and has led to a vast waste of money and has actually given people things that that have relatively little labour market value. Whatever their intrinsic learning value, they are not particularly great experiences. Because the other thing is that in, in, take, in finding the money to fund trains again, the previous government raided the lifelong learning um, budget in ways that it will probably never ever recover from in my lifetime. Was that a good trade-off? Open question. <laughs> Uh, Paul Hackney, uh, stand up, Paul. Yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Paul Hackney, freelance uh, consultant. I, I enjoyed your historical perspective, particularly the reference to YTS and the equality of YTS. I, I just wondered, looking back quite a while, and might be other people remember, when there were, were industrial training boards and there was a statutory obligation on the part, behalf of employers to participate in uh, education and training for the apprenticeships, whether well, that actually started the decline from then, unless there is a statutory obligation, then you're wasting your time really. I think that certainly when the, when the statutory IT, most of the statutory ITBs were wound up, the thinking on the part of the government at the time was that employers were just being constrained by this, this terrible bureaucracy and that once they were freed up, and once the economy had recovered, employers would really invest in the training that they needed and everything would go forward from there. Well, it, in a sense, it did. Employers do invest in the training they need. No two ways about it. Most firms invest in the amount of training and the type of training for those employees that require it that they need. The problem is that the level to which that takes place and the distribution across the working population are not the ones to which policymakers aspire. And that's where the catch comes in. Shifting that is going to be really really difficult, and particularly within a voluntary system. I don't know what the answer is, except to try and move away <coughs> from framing it as a training issue. <coughs> it seems to me that endlessly exhorting employers to do more training is a waste of time. Employers are pretty resistant to that message, and I, in part I don't really blame them. Um, I'm not going to train more than I need to, unless I can see some kind of business, long-term business case to it seems to me that through biz business improvement policy, economic development policy, through various ways that one might regulate the over time the labour market, you could begin to change employers' structural demand for skills and therefore increase the amount of time, energy and money they invest in training. But until you go down that road, we really are going to struggle to get employers to do more than they currently feel inclined to do. Will that include the initial investing in the design of pathways? Does the same point apply? It, it may very well do. I mean, it seems to me that one of the interesting issues when you look at what has happened with, with pathway design in other countries is that it has been relatively dependent upon employers collectively seeing it as a problem, feeling slightly responsible for dealing with it rather than just fobbing it off, and having employer bodies, usually at sectoral level, that are actually capable of progressing the issue. Now, there are plainly some of our sector skills councils that could progress that issue. And there are others where I think the question would be a very open one, whether they have the resources, the motivation, or the contact with their members to make any progress whatsoever. And that's part of the problem. Can I just not, I just have got a question on to others, but Deirdre Young, but since you're a commissioner, you did mention the commission. And last year, we had the we are the mentioned last year was from the um, chief executive of the commission, and the commission is and its policy is to is to have employer led approaches mm -hmm. for precisely these kinds of reasons. Mm -hmm. uh, and I just wondered whether you might want to a comment or ask a question or whatever in relation to this issue, because it seems to me the, the commission is one of the vehicles mm -hmm. which has been established and is now being managed to try to do this, but it is not easy. Do you want to stand up Thank you for that, Tony. Uh, well, first of all, thank you. I'd be delighted to go back and report to uh, Charlie Nathan and all the other commissioners um, how you're uh, finding the work valuable. Um, I suppose my question that was going on in, in my mind really was for you, uh, Ewart, which, which was around 
you know, we've got a new minister now, a new skilled minister, and uh, very keen to make his mark. And in looking at this whole issue of credentialism, apprenticeships, traineeships, and employer ownership, and um, I think without doubt, from a commission's point of view, and you'll see this next year, that you know the government's announcement in England, particularly around the industrial strategy, you know that strong emphasis on employer engagement, <coughs> and employer stepping up to the challenge. You know, everyone had a youth policy. Um, uh, my question to you was around the traineeships. You know that that uh, are on the horizon that came out of the Richard review, which was the simple message was to say that apprenticeships need to be proper apprenticeships <coughs> in line to some extent with what we're seeing in other parts of Europe. And so in order <coughs> to get us to that point, then we need traineeships. Mm -hmm. And uh, just was wondering, listening to you, you know, <coughs> and, um, how are we going to get these messages out now to young people and parents and others? This is what an apprentice is and this is what a traineeship is and you know the differences. <coughs> but that's the key problem. I mean, I think that in a sense we're going to now find that the consequences of a loose usage of the definition of apprenticeship in past years is going to come back to haunt us. It will haunt us also, I think, with employers. And I think a lot of employers have now, insofar as they've got the vaguest of notions, particularly in the service sector, what apprenticeship is. Uh, it's just another government, it's another potential stream of government mm -hmm. um, sponsorship to help support some kind of training. Uh, and that is not really been much more specific than that. If, look, there's a huge if, the rich and review recommendations get implemented, and I wouldn't bank my pension, bet my pension on that one, um, it seems to me that yes, we are going to have a much narrower and probably rather more useful definition of apprenticeship. We are gonna have to have things that are alongside that. There still will be, as there always have been, adult workers who need skills upgrade, accreditation of prior learning, whatever, but we won't be able to call that apprenticeship and there probably won't be any government funding for it. The employers will have to deal with that themselves. And there will certainly be for many young people who mm -hmm. cannot directly access apprenticeship because they're not at the, the sufficient level to do so, are going to need help. All the more so because of the now the, the requirement the, the requirement that they've now got to do maths and English GCSE of some form. That that is going to or, well actually it won't be GCSE because GCSE is going to vanish. Um, but that's that's going to be a big problem for many training providers and for many employers. So I do think that yes there will have to be some kind of pre apprenticeship for quite a lot of, of young people who actually want to access apprenticeship and would benefit from it. But I think there is a broader problem. And the broader problem is one that I've realized more and more over time, simply because it's sort of built up in my head, is the way in which we fiddle with institutions, funding schemes, qualifications, and programs like apprenticeship. They change and get rebranded and recalibrated because every incoming minister, just like the new one, wants to make their mark, and their mark is to fiddle around with things. Now, it's great for them. It's pretty stupid from the point of view that people actually have to run the education and training system and make it work. But from the point of view of young people and their parents, it renders the whole thing completely incomprehensible. And I don't know any other developed country that does this to the same extent as we do. In fact, if there was an OECD league table <laughs> with our education <laughs> system, I could guarantee that we would be top of it every single year. But there's always the vocational side, which has to be changed, not the academic side. Well, except the oh, A-levels and the ANGCs. Well, well, okay, okay, okay. okay. Just, <laughs> just a one, two, three. Okay. There's, there's a, I mean, as, as you're talking, I'm saying that you've got this, you've got the idea that we've got apprenticeship which we need to kind of ramp up and make into a more substantial thing and then we've got a whole group of people who perhaps aren't ready for that or as you say the, the work that they're doing does not necessarily require that level of education and what I've heard people like Alison Wolf say is well aren't we keeping people in education too long aren't we 
um, keeping people in education when there isn't really a need for it. And, um, and wouldn't it be better, and you, you kind of touched on it, wouldn't it be better to try and calibrate employers' expectations a bit more and to provide a, a, a kind of, basically to reinvigorate a, a straight from school youth labour market where um, employers recognise they're going to recruit people for low skill jobs and provide them with the kind of minimum training that they require for that job, and then they do the job. Now, now there, there's an attract, there's an oh, attract, yeah. there's an attraction to that. But my my concern with it will be the point you just made, which yeah. is where then is the progression ladder? Uh, which it, it was, it's very attractive from the point of view of, of of employers, but it's not attractive from the point of view of society and young people. No, I mean, oh, and actually, as they get older. They're still going to be stuck in these jobs, so a lot will be minor. I think the one way you might think about it, given the, I mean, basically, you you have a choice. It seems to me, or well, three choices, as far as I can see. One is that you carry on pretty much as the moment, and that you do you basically provide training that is broader. You aim to provide training that is broader and deeper than what employers currently need for young people in some. Um, sectors and occupations, but you hope that enough of that learning is transferable or it allows them to re-access um, um, learning further down the road, which is what many European countries do. But that would require substantial changes uh, in, in the way that we, we organise things. Obviously, the, we could just carry on as we do at the moment. Second one is Alison's idea, which is, is I think you, you've, you've sort of summed up very neatly. Fewer people go through, more people enter the labour market, and we just stop this nonsense that she would think of it of, 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 just, of you know, so everyone participating from 16 to 19. Um, and in a sense, that, that, you know, it, is a, it is a bit of a nonsense because it doesn't match up with the labor, what the labour market really requires. But, 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 but A third way to go, if we're not willing to regulate the labour market, if we're not willing to try and push employers very hard, would be to say, well, we've got voluntary, a voluntary lane raising the learning age, whatever that means, because as it's voluntary, it doesn't seem to me there is a raising of the learning age in any shape or form, but no matter. But that we actually start to think about rebalancing our resources, and that we basically try to provide more second chance opportunities for people. So yes, they do aim to crap jobs, and whatever we do with the initial training system, they're going to land up in crap jobs. But what we have to try to do is give those who've got the ability or the, uh, the, the gap and go or the opportunity to actually return to learning and do something different and retrain or move on and move up and move out. That would be the kind of thing which I suppose that in a way the NIAC inquiry into lifelong learning suggested that we rebalance the learning funds so that we give people a life, some kind of lifelong learning account. We don't front load every, the vast bulk of spending onto young people. Now that's, that's just revolutionary talk. I mean, I just, can I come back on that? Because I think, to me, one of the key, if, if, you, if you imagine that situation where a number of people finish school and they go into work and they, they take up uh, work without qualification, then that that re-engaging them in the learning yeah, system is, is, is going to be very challenging. And to me, one of the one of the, the elements that needs to be there, as well as adequately funded adult education, which we're a long way away from at the moment, yeah. but one of the other ones is uh, an advice and guidance or careers yes. intervention that can work into the workplace. Which is again is currently not there at all. I mean, it would be. I mean, we could, there are models of it we can think of, but, but essentially, it would be about inventing a way that something like the National Career Service could work into employers and and engage with with low skilled workers and re-engage them then in, in a kind of renewed. <coughs> as you say, it's, it's quite a big shift, isn't it? But it, I mean, it, it seems right to me. But I mean, it is a big, it is a big ask. You, union Learn would argue that some of their, so they're, they're yeah, really, really good, you know, they're at the upper end of the scale, that's what some of their, their good union learning reps are actually doing, and I think that's probably true. The problem, of course, is that the vast bulk of private sector workplaces are no longer unionised, so it doesn't get to them. But I do think that there is a real issue about our, we, we have continued to obsess about initial education and training, and we have tended to neglect second chance learning adult development. And when we have tried to do it, we haven't, and particularly in people who are trained to gain, we haven't done it terribly well. Very good. I think we will have to make this the last church, but you put your hand up some time ago. It's been here. Yeah. Um.